Today, we're going to go over how investors can go about building robust factor portfolios in just three easy steps. We'll first go over why factor investing could prove beneficial to investors, which factors could potentially bring about the best returns, and which could bring about the best diversification benefits. But investor beware, factor investing is not an easy thing to do. So we're also going to have to touch on what investors should expect if they decide to embark on this journey. So first off, why select factors? Factors can be thought of as additional sources of risk and return that could be added on top of different asset classes. And as with any source of risk and return, there are potential diversification benefits that could be attained by investing in that asset. But it's not just about the diversification one can gain from these factors. Because these sources of returns can be added on top of asset classes, they have historically added quite a bit of return. Remember, even a 1% return above the market or above any asset class could add outsized gains over the long term. So for example, when investing in stocks, you could target the value factor and invest in stocks that are trading at bargain prices as compared to their earnings or any other fundamental metric. Or one could invest in momentum or stocks that show strong performance against a basket of its peers, size or stocks with smaller market caps or profitability, or stocks with healthy operating margins. Today, we're specifically going to look at value, momentum, size, and profitability factors, gathering data straight from the Kenneth French Data Library from Dartmouth College, and run a horse race to answer the next two questions. The first one, which factors have performed more favorably? And the second one, which can add more diversification benefits to index investors. So let's start off with a quick horse race on which factors have performed the best. And you can see that momentum had the best returns during this period, followed by profitability, value, and lastly, size. Looking at these returns, your first instinct might be to say, hey, that blue line surely does look pretty sweet. Let's put all our money in there. But hold on. These returns are long short, meaning that not only are you investing in the top stocks with factor loadings, but you're also shorting the opposite side of that bet. So for example, in the momentum factor, not only are you investing in the strongest stocks, but you are also shorting the weaker stocks. And if you plan to invest in a long short manner, then this data makes sense. And if you can live with some of the crashes involved in long short investing, then by all means, go ahead. But assuming you are a long only investor, meaning you're not shorting anything, then one needs to make a whole different assessment. For example, looking at this chart, you could conclude that the profitability factor has fared better than the value or HML factor. Of course, once you look at long only top test held portfolios, the whole story changes. See here, value looks like one of the stronger contenders. Obviously, if the question is which of these factors do better, there's absolutely no debate. Value and momentum have the largest historical premium. Of course, I must remind you that these are paper portfolios, so the returns would have likely been smaller, but still, these are pretty impressive numbers. So if your only concern is return, I think targeting those two factors can make a whole lot of sense. However, these portfolios can go through long periods of underperformance compared to the market. If you don't believe me, just look at the past 15 years. And if you don't have enough conviction in these strategies, well, you could be in for a world of pain and therefore susceptible to sell at the worst possible time. After all, conviction cannot be borrowed. So let's investigate how index investors could potentially diversify their portfolio and limit regret aversion. Since we've already determined that we're investing in a long only fashion, let's look at our long only correlations. So as you can see, and thankfully for index investors, value and momentum are the least correlated to the market. But it's not just that. Value and momentum portfolios are also not so correlated with each other. In fact, in this whole table, value and momentum seem to be bringing in the most diversification benefits. So we've already determined that at least historically, factors are diversified sources of risk and return. And among those factors, value and momentum seem to add the most historical returns and diversification benefits. So let's now ask this question. How much should one invest in these two factors? And the answer is that it really does depend. 
But in general, anywhere from 20 to 50% of deeply concentrated factor exposures could get you the benefits of factor investing. Anything under that would not do too much, while anything over that would require a whole nother level of conviction. In short, the less you care about what the market is doing, the more you could invest in factors. But if tracking error is just too painful for you, maybe just ease off the pedal. As always, everything comes down to your goals, your risk tolerance, and your ability to stay the course. Factor investing can offer powerful long-term benefits, but only if you're comfortable enough with the journey it takes to get there. Here at Alpha Architect, our goal is to empower investors through education. We're an asset management firm that focuses on delivering affordable alpha to our clients. If you want more educational content like this, head to alphaarchitect.com. I'll see you there.